you know, my poetry is poetry in much the same way, you know, Burger King is farm to table dining. I mean, you know, I have enormous respect for real poets. It's funny because, you know, in high school and college, poetry is, is forced on you. And it certainly didn't take for me. I often had no idea what was going on in a poem. It bored me. Um, the irony is in researching how poetry is written and how it's done, I, I've read a lot of poetry and I have this newfound love for it. Right about now. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Right About Now podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Small, and once again, it is a pleasure to have you with me today. My guest is John Kenny, who is the author of the new book, Love Poems for Anxious People. Now, John is a frequent contributor to The New Yorker magazine, where he has been writing for the Shouts and Murmur column since 1999. His new book is part three of a series of funny poetry collections, including Love Poems for Married People and Love Poems for People with Children. John has also written the novels Talk to Me and Truth in Advertising, the latter which won him the Thurber Prize for American Humor. So as you will see, John is a funny guy, and like many funny creative people, he grapples with that anxious voice in the back of his head that tells him he's really not funny at all and he should just hang it up. And we talk a lot about that. We talk a lot about that insecurity and about how both of our self-deprecating humor gives us something to write about, but also can be sort of a bad thing sometimes. John also reads some of my favorite poems in the book, which is a real treat. Look, if you like to laugh and you're feeling a bit anxious about the state of the world at the moment, this might be a nice little break. So, John Kenny, welcome to Write About Now. Thank you so much for having me. Such a funny book of poems. You're really, you definitely captured, I don't know, you didn't really mean to probably, because probably when you came up with the, the idea for this book, you had no idea what was about to happen in our world, right? You were just, I would imagine you were just basically writing about anxiousness and then, wow, the whole world became very anxious. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> good timing, oh, unfortunately. Well, <laughs> well, let's see. It's either really good timing or really bad. And, uh, <laughs> exactly. Let's wait a month or two. Yeah. I had written a couple of other books, love poems for married people and love poems for people with children. And, you know, my editor and I were knocking around ideas late last fall for the next one. And, uh, clever titles such as love poems for almost divorced people, mm -hmm. uh, love poems for the criminally insane, love poems for... These are all books that I would pick up, by the way. Yeah, anyway. absolutely. Huge bestsellers in, in Russia. Um, so we, um, we settled on anxiety because I think like, you know, marriage and children, uh, it's fairly universal. The sort of the low grade anxiety that a lot of us walk around with each day. Uh, and especially now, right? Yeah. Well, now it's insane. Uh, and it seems like if you didn't have anxiety before this, <laughs> then welcome to my world. It's a wonderful introduction to anxiety, these times we're living in. Now, you are a New Yorker, so just naturally anxious. It's just, you know, New Yorkers. <laughs> I mean, I, as a New Yorker myself, although I live in Los Angeles, so I don't know, that made me even more anxious actually moving out here. But have you always been an anxious person? Tell us a little bit about your background. So I know you grew up in, in Massachusetts, right? Yep. I grew up in Boston in one of the, the neighborhoods there uh, in, a, in a big family. I have five brothers. Wow. And, and uh, uh, my dad was a firefighter, one of those big sort of Boston Irish Catholic families. And, you know, everyone's like, I'm the least funny by far. They're, they're just very <laughs> funny, quick guys. And uh, so you had to keep yeah, up. I, you had to keep up. So, yeah, I, I mean, I got into, you know, I graduated with a liberal arts degree. So I'm, you know, I, I have no skills of any kind. So I got into advertising. So I did that. And I, I, I moved to New York uh, for what I thought would be two years. And that was like 25 years ago. 
And you were trying to be a writer, though, during that time. Well, I mean, you're writing yes. as you're a copywriter. So you're in advertising in the creative side of things. Yes. Yeah. What, what kind and of what kind of writing were you doing in advertising? Like what kind of copywriting? You know, writing at, you know, writing TV commercials for, you know, big companies for American Express and for, you know, Citibank and BP. And was it uh, funny stuff? I mean, how could it not be? So, so, you know, it's funny because some some of it was some of it was sort of the, you know, the big heartfelt American expression <laughs> commercial. Uh, but on the side, I was always trying to, to write. And, you know, I, I was submitting things places. I submitted to The New Yorker for 10 years. Oh, my uh, goodness. Before they took a piece. <laughs> well, that uh, shows that shows dedication. And, and what kind of pieces were you submitting to them? I was submitting, you know, to shouts and murmurs. Right. Uh, I was submitting spectacularly bad pieces that they were kind enough to send a little note saying doesn't quite work for us, but you know, <laughs> good luck elsewhere. Ha ha. Right. Um, and then they took a piece, and uh, you know, I became a multimillionaire and now live in the south of France. That's a lie. <laughs> There's no money in writing. Uh, There's but- money in advertising. You were at least smart enough to make that choice because you know I made the choice of becoming a writer, but in the magazine industry. Good choice, John. Small. Yeah. I mean, it could have been, it could have been worse. It could have been newspapers yeah. or po- poetry. Yes. <laughs> so what was this, the first story that they bought? It's interesting because I had been writing a lot and I had saved all these pieces and they were really spectacularly bad. <laughs> and my computer was stolen from work Oh God! and it had everything I'd ever written on it. And I didn't, <laughs> Cleverly, I didn't have it backed up and I was shattered. Oh my God. And terrifying. Not long after I was at home and I had, I was listening to NPR and there was a story about uh, the J Peterman catalog going bankrupt. <laughs> right. Made famous walking, from Seinfeld episodes. Yeah. And I'm, I'm walking to the subway and I got an idea, you know, what the piece was called the last catalog. And Peterman, you know, was they would be selling off all of their stuff, like fire sale stuff, but written in the sort of that Peterman-esque patois. <laughs> so uh, I wrote it very quickly and I walked it over to the New Yorker. They were on 43rd Street for a long time. Madison Avenue. I had never been in before and I just walked it over. It was a Thursday and I hand delivered it and I thought, well, that, you know, that's, that's that and got a sandwich. And about six o'clock that night, my phone rang and, you know, all of my friends on the eighth floor at, at Ogilvy and Mather, you know, knew I would submit these pieces and, you know, would <laughs> roundly laugh at me for doing it. Um, <laughs> so they said, this is the New Yorker magazine would like to run your piece. And I thought it was a friend of mine making fun of me. Right. And I'm like, listen, you know, dude, this isn't funny. Not I'm hanging funny. Up. Yeah. And they're like, this is the New Yorker magazine. And I was like, oh, so that was, that was, that, that must was have been nice. pretty thrilling. Were you very excited? I, I was really thrilled because I, you know, we did not have the New Yorker in my house growing up, but I discovered it after college. I was dating a, a girl in West Hartford, Connecticut, and uh, I, I picked up the magazine and it was one of those, it sounds so cliched, but I was like, oh, what's this? Right. Just loved the shouts and murmurs people, and started reading, you know, the Jack Handys and the the Ian Frasers, and you know, going back James Thurber and and all of those people. And I was like, wow, this is just Veronica Gang and all these really funny people. And I was like, I want to do that. When you were a kid, before you discovered the New Yorker, what what were some of your influence? Were you reading like Mad Magazine, and what were the, some of the things you were reading when you were younger? So there's a huge age gap in my family, um, as is common in big Boston Irish families. Uh-huh. Uh, there's, a, there's a 14 year age gap between oldest and youngest. So oh, wow. my my brothers were reading National Lampoon. Right. And you know, I still remember the cover: "Buy this magazine, or we'll shoot this dog." <laughs> and I just thought that's awesome. You know, like a million kids. You know, right. I, was, I was 12 Would years old. Would never happen today. If you, by the way, if I think about that, no, no, whatever years. company or magazine that they would be run out of business yeah. by people who, you know, the animal rights activists right. and people who just sort of have outlawed humor. And uh, yeah, and, and uh, then when I was 12 years old on the local, you know, WGBH station, I saw Monty Python. The, the first skit that I ever saw was the Ministry of Silly Walks. And I thought, I'm home. 
these are my people. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I, the, I, the, you know, I mean, you know, there's a million kids out there who have the same story. You're just, you find people with this sense of humor and you're like, oh, I love that. Yeah. Like you're not, I know you're not supposed to laugh at that because it's so dark and, and, but I love this. So yeah, that's how it started. And it was just perseverance. You were just like, you, what, what made you not give up after all these rejections from the New Yorker? Um, I, I, you know, I, I think if you write to get published, if you write to make money, it's a long day. Mm. That's not to say I don't want to be published. I do. I, I you know, I, I hope to make a few bucks from it, but I, I do it because it's, I think who you are and what you do is when everything else, like after you've eaten, after you've gone for a run, after you tend to your kids, after you do whatever, when you're given a few hours, what you do with that time, if you do carpentry, if you do yoga, if you meditate, for me, when I'm given time, I write, or, or I think about writing, or I make notes about writing, or I mm -hmm. read something. About, that's, that's what I, so I'm going to do this, whether you get paid or not, right? You're not. And so I would get these ideas and I would write them down and I would send them to the New Yorker and they would reject them. And I would, for a while I was convinced no one was reading them. So my cover letters to things would be like, you know, I'd write a piece about prune danishes and I'd write, um, I've enclosed a piece that I think could be really funny. It's about hieroglyphics during the, you know, pre-Egyptian era. And they would write back like, what are you talking about? Right. Have you ever read our magazine? We're still, yeah, we're still rejecting it, but what is your note about? So I was like, yes, they're reading it. And uh, so, I, yeah, I mean, I gathered all of my rejections and I, I, I put them on my wall in my apartment and I was very proud of them. Do you still have them? That's a good collection. You know, I'm, I'm crushed to tell you that we had a bunch of stuff in storage in Brooklyn and we went to our storage facility this was a couple of years ago and it was empty. <laughs> no, somebody stole yeah. it. Someone, they sold it all like my books and from college and Aww. notebook and stuff like that. And I, I've had some bad luck with, with that. So uh, I do not have them, but <laughs> I, you know, my writing career is such that that is not the last time I will get a rejection notice. So, right. So, so I'm, I'm confident I'll get more. So, where do you come up with these ideas, you know, for, let's talk about shouts and murmurs first here. Like, is there a formula to it? I know that you, obviously you're just writing because you, you're writing about what you think is funny or, or what you just want to write about, whether you think it's funny or not. You just want to write about that. Uh, you, maybe you find humor in something, but was there, did it have to be sort of, I, I noticed a lot of times shouts and murmurs are very topical. Like they're sort of based on something that's kind of topical and then kind of a riff on that. Like you even mentioned the Jay Peterman catalog was the the one yeah. at that time that was a sort of a topical um yeah i think the best ones uh, i think those can be really funny like right. I, I you know while andy borowitz doesn't technically write for shouts and murmurs you know i think what andy borowitz does is topical and hilarious i mean yeah, I just, it's amazing andy's just he's 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 a machine i mean i emailed him last week or two weeks ago because he's just been killing it with the, <laughs> the 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 stuff lately he's just it's unbelievable. His stuff is so good that sometimes people think it's real, which is really sort of the ultimate yeah. compliment, he's right? Also, Andy Boris is also one of the nicest human beings I have ever met. He's just he's just a great, great guy. He's an he's annoyingly nice and talented. Right. Ugh, uh, I hate that guy. Uh, that makes I, me anxious. Yeah. Exactly. Can't he's you just be one or the other? It's like really good looking people who are also really smart. Oh, wow, he's just he's the nice guy in the world. Yeah. Um so you know how it is. I mean, you're walking down the street, you're taking a shower, you, you, you just think of something that makes you kind of laugh. And then, then you try to write it, then you try to get it into 800 or 1000 words and not ruin it and not be boring and, and send it in and hope that they, they like it, which they do, they do, they don't always. <laughs> Maybe that's just me. But I, I think some of the better shouts, like the, the sort of the rock stars of shouts and murmurs, you know, the Ian Frazier, mm -hmm. Jack Handy, you know, they rarely write on, on timely stuff. They're, they're, they're somewhat timeless. Right. It just comes out of there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those guys are just playing at a different level. They're just, 
they're really really good you know veronica gang i don't know if i mentioned her name if, if your listeners are not familiar with her and she's her her shout stuff she she passed away a while back but um it's perfect yeah so yeah. once that happened for you um yeah. you got the published by the new yorker did your life change at all or did it kind of you know obviously it was a big boost for your ego and i'm sure it could, it, it it was thrilling to be published in the New Yorker after all these years of trying. Did it? Did they suddenly start accepting more of your stories? Were you sort of in in all of a sudden at the New Yorker, or was it just as hard? It definitely helped. It helped that they knew my name. They were more likely, I think, to read something right. I had written. You know, then you'd do a couple of more, maybe. And and what it did help with was. You know, I was writing a novel around that time and, you know, someone there connected me with an agent. And mm. so in that way, it helped me get a little further down the path. Yeah. Right. And, you know, the agent led to, you know, a, a book deal. And and that and, book deal uh, was your first novel. Well, I had written a novel that was really spectacularly bad, um, <laughs> but, and, but fortunately no one published it. You know, it was one of those situations where I, j I couldn't stop writing yeah but I didn't know what the book was about which is not good but I took you know a couple of thousand words and from that started a new novel and, and that was the became my first published novel which was truth and advertising yeah which was a big hit it, 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 it you know I don't know if it was a big hit but it, it, it was big it, did, it got some it got some good reviews and you know I, I, I was very fortunate I, I so so that was that was you know that was good. Once that happened, did you quit your day job or have you continued in your advertising pursuits? Uh, I did quit. I mostly I, I when I do uh, advertising work and I, I still I enjoy doing it. And it's, you know, really does help pay the bills. Yeah, and stuff. I imagine. It's, it's, as a, it's as a freelance writer. OK, uh, you know, I'll know. I know a few folks at some different agencies and, and they're kind enough to call sometimes. But, you know, I work from home and I, I've got two kids. I started late, so I got some little kids, uh, you know, like 11 and almost eight and oh cool yeah so then uh you know i got optioned and i turned it into a screenplay and and then started this second novel and and the rest is really it's just it's just it's just history Jonathan. it's just history at this point it's just history. Well, when did the, when did the whole idea for love poems come up and how did that tell me about the origin of that because then you yeah. made that into sort of a series of different books yeah i had written a uh, New Yorker piece called Valentine's Day Poems for Married People. Mm -hmm. like it's already funny. Years, That's just what? Well, like four <laughs> years ago or so. And it was, you know, I mean, as you can tell from the title, it was uh, a an unromantic take on Valentine's Day, you know, for longtime married people. I think the first poem in the piece was about a guy who had forgotten that it was Valentine's <laughs> Day and came home drunk, which is funny. Um, and it's, and it's funny because it's true. <laughs> not based on my own life. Right. Um, so that piece, you know, kind of did okay. And it got passed around a bit and each ensuing Valentine's day, it would kind of pop up on the site. And I was at a, like a cocktail reception at my publisher. And I was talking to someone I didn't know. And she said, you wrote that, you know, New Yorker piece. And I was like, yeah. And she said, you know, you should make that into a book. And I'm like, absolutely. And, <laughs> I found out she was the head of Penguin Random House. That's a good person and, to know. And, but I didn't know. And I think I like spilled something on her. Or <laughs> of course you did. And my editor called the next day and said, so we're, I got an email from her. We're going to make that into a book. And so we did. And again, we had some luck with that. Did okay. And, and, uh, and then we did love poems for uh, people with children. And that did okay. And, you know, th those sort of organic to like, now, the love poems for people with children, are, are you just sort of following the tra trajectory of your own life? Was that like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> this is I what I need to write about right now because this is insane. Yeah, I, my, my editor called me and said, look, you know, you've sold a few books and we should do another one. And it seems like we should do children. And I was like, Be you know, because in the first one, I wrote about children as well, just not as many and, and it just, you know, life with children, as you well know. Do you have one or two? What I have two. Years? I've got a 14 and an 11 year old. So I, I know, I know no, the pain. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's, Although it's changing now so that it evolves. Yeah. But it's madness. I mean, <laughs> these strange you know, little creatures are in your house. Yeah, I know. Like marriage and children, it's like, 
this is insane. This right. is a, these are terrible ideas, but we do them because it's like, you know what? Mine will be different. <laughs> right. Um, right. <laughs> I'm married to like the greatest woman in the world and it's, and it's still hard. Right. And she's like, really, that's who you are. Right. It all comes out. You think marriage it is a big deal, out. but it all it's out. nothing, nothing compared to having kids. Marriage is a, then, a life changer, but not, yeah. not and like then, having kids. And then the kid thing, it's like, Holy crap. wow, who yeah. are you? <laughs> Why are you yeah, in my you're home? Living, and you're sta- and you're you're staying here for a while. Yeah, I know. Why? Like, where, where did you, you come from? Right. Yeah. Can I take you back? You yeah. Yeah. Um, but that said, I mean, I got married late, and I'm I've been married for 15 years, very very happily. And I mean, my wife is my best friend. Aww. You know, and you know, she she really is. I mean, she's yeah. she's she's you know, not to sound like a complete weenie, but she's made me such a vastly better human being. Is she um, your editor? Does she read all your yeah, stuff? Yeah, I mean, my editor is this wonderful, wonderful woman named Sally Kim at, at Putnam. Um, but, you know, my wife, Lissa, sees everything I do and makes it better because she's a tough laugh. You know, she's not going to, she's right. just going to, she'll give you this look after she reads something, just like, wow, I mean, you're embarrassing yourself. And oh, um, that, yeah. oh she's tough. She's great. Um, but that's what I want. I don't want people to be like, that's funny. Because, you know, 99% of the time, what I do is terrible. Some of my critics would say 100% of the time, but so be it. <laughs> uh, but she, she edits everything. She helps me come up with ideas. And, and so... Uh, so this idea it, of doing poetry, I mean, you had never set out to be a poet. You know, you were doing humorous essays and you were yeah, writing novels. Yeah, and you, and did, you do this one article for the New Yorker. I don't know how many poems you had written before that. Were you a prolific poet? poet before that or was that just sort of a one-off that all of a sudden became "Uh uh-oh this is now my destiny for the next three books yeah the (laughs) the the second um (laughs) right and you know let me be very clear you know my poetry is poetry in much the same way you know burger king is farm to table dining (laughs) you know i have enormous respect for real poets um it's funny because, you know, in high school and college, uh, uh, you know, poetry is, is forced on you. And it certainly didn't take for me. I, I often had no idea what was going on in a poem. Uh, and, and it, 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 it bored me. Um, the irony is in researching how poetry is written and how it's done. I, I've read a lot of poetry And I have this um, newfound love for it because, you know, prose is one thing. Prose is the long runway, right? Right. Whereas poetry is the ability to take the almost ineffable and put it down on paper so that you read something and you're like, my God, someone (laughs) understands my soul. Right. (laughs) Like, that that it's is distilled that, yeah and very yeah that's so you know poetry is is you know it's it's closer to music i mm-hmm. think right and i have no ability to to write or play music music is greek to me i i, I love it but I, i'm like how, how do you how did you think to make that noise i don't right and, th- and that's great poetry for me right the the sort of seamus haney's and the mary oliver's and the the sharon olds and and you know the Audens and the, the stuff that really that that grabs you by the the collar and just sort of s- makes you feel alive and human and understood and because I think we do our lives are completely unique and 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 yet there are such universal shared feelings and experiences and that place is a really interesting place to 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 be i i want to i want to find a truth but i also want to be ridiculous and make people people laugh right right? i mean i do hope there's a truth in it because otherwise it's it's otherwise what's the point well that's the thing all your your poems and we talk about your most current book love poems for anxious people you know you find these moments truths um, in everyday life. And then you, and then you write a poem around it. I'd love you to sort of take us through like the anatomy of, of how that all works. Like what's your process with that? Do you, 
jot down moments or are you just inspired by a moment and then you write a poem? Like, how do you, how do you tackle these different poems about different scenarios in your life, whether it's meditating or the conversations you have with yourself very, very late at night, which are hilarious. Thank you. Yeah. So it's, I think for me, what tends to work is if I can find the title, um, mm. like that's, that's a lot of the heavy lifting, Interesting. you know, like something like there's a poem in the new one, uh, eulogy, you know, I'll just, uh, the idea of giving a eulogy is so stressful and anxiety making. And it's also already just dark because, you know, there's a, there's a dead person in the room. Um, right. But you're uh, setting up. So one of your great tricks is that you set up kind of like eulogy. So it's going to be dark, but then yeah. you're going to twist it. I don't know if you have it in front of you. I have it in front of me. Would you mind reading? Is it a long one? It is not long. All right. Let's do that one. Do you mind reading okay. it? That would be awesome. Eulogy. We are here today to celebrate the life of Martin Greengrass, father, grandfather, dear friend, and I, Nathan, his eldest grandson, have been chosen to give his eulogy. Where do I begin? Boy, was he old. Also, apparently, eulogy is from the Greek word to praise, or possibly to die. I'm not sure, as I just looked that one up on my phone. If I appear a bit nervous, it's because I am. The thing is, I've never given a eulogy, but I wrote something last night and put it on my desk, next to the work presentation I have later today to our agency's Coffee Mate client. And so what I have here is, in fact, my Coffee Mate presentation. The irony, of course, is that Martin loved Coffee Mate, the original flavor, but also French vanilla, Irish cream, and our newest flavor, hazelnut. I would now like to open it up for questions about Martin, as well as Coffee Mate's marketing strategy for Q4. See now, that's hilarious. How do you, that is so random. I mean, are you just, so you've got eulogy. So you got this yeah. idea that you're going to write a eulogy and obviously it's going to be, it's not going to be sad, but it's, you know, I love how you sort of set it up where it starts like any other eulogy and then it just goes in this crazy direction. Which is very Monty Python, by the way. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think funny stuff is about shock and surprise. It's about some kind of turn that you didn't expect, right? Yep. And I think also it's about pain. I think the ability to laugh at pain is uh, helps you get through the day. Particularly now. So in the case of the uh, eulogy, yes. are... are it coffee me i mean were you just sort of sitting there writing it and then also or did you is that a similar was that based on something that actually happened to you or no no it, it was not based i've only given one eulogy and i did not mention coffee mate <laughs> good no. you didn't bring your presentation uh, did you work on the coffee mate account it, it uh very very <laughs> briefly uh, <laughs> okay I, I i did a, a little project for them years ago but you know, I honestly don't remember. I have a very, I have a terrible memory. And when I write something, like I'll go back and look at something and think, hmm, I have absolutely no memory of writing that. Right. But you just did it. You know, you start out with something and I don't know, you just rework it and you hope for some kind of, you hope to make yourself laugh, I guess. If you can chuckle a little bit while you're writing these things. Right. I dated a woman who was a, it was a comic and she would be writing stuff and she had this rule for herself she said if i have to lie to myself and say oh that's kind of funny you know i need to make myself laugh or it's not funny and and i just i thought that was a pretty good honest tough rule right you're and, probably your uh, toughest critic yeah i hope so although right. i have not been to the amazon comments section recently i'm sure there are <laughs> do you do that do you torture yourself i have friends who are writers oh. that just do that just to make themselves crazy with the first novel, I am embarrassed to tell you, I, I checked it hourly. Uh, and it's, <laughs> you know, the worst place in the world is to go to Goodreads. Um, oh, God, they're so mean. It's it's really Even mean. the greatest books, you'll be like, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird. I don't know. Yeah. I felt it was kind of, <laughs> you know, it's just like, yeah, yeah. kind of overrated. 
I was disappointed. They didn't kill a single bird. <laughs> it's uh, look, I'm all for for you know everyone having a say, but uh, I I I look at the comments less and less because I, I you know I don't. But you actually did a video on YouTube in which you read your worst reviews. A waste of money. This book was the worst. Even my husband thought it was a without merit. <clears throat> so thank you to my mom. This is a sublime and remarkable collection, surely one of our finest poets, writing at the top of her power. Her power. Uh, you know what, that's my bad. Uh, that's a review uh, from a collection by uh, Mary Oliver. A toxic little book touting the selfishness of men. Why do we do that to ourselves? Why do we especially creative people why do we must we only it's like a stand-up comic who will find the only person in the audience who's not laughing at their joke and and focus their entire routine to that person i don't know what because that is because i think creative people all people chase affirmation hmm. we we want people to like us and to tell us they like us um was that good was that good was that good yeah is it good like, you know, after this call, I'm going to get off and I'm going to review our call and <laughs> I'm going to beat the crap out of myself and be like, oh, my God, my answer was so stupid. I should have said this. No, this. you were you were really I mean, I would have changed a few things. No, you were really good. <laughs> but, but you know, I think that's part of, you know, yeah. this the, the sort of this book. I think, you know, we all have that voice in our head most every moment of every day that is weirdly not really our friend. Like right? he or she kind of likes to beat the heck out of us. You know, and we do review conversations and we do, we, it's, it's like a little screenwriter. We make up these stories about someone or something that happened to us. And we, you know, we are so far out of the present, which is, you know, I mean, it's, it's very hard to stay in, but it's not only that we take ourselves out of the present, we make up stuff. You know, there's this, I, I use this quote from the French essayist, Michel de Montaigne, as the epigraph to this book, Love Poems for Anxious People, he has a great line. He was actually a very funny writer. I'm not kidding. Mm -hmm. uh, his line is, um, my life has been full of terrible misfortunes, most of which never happened. <laughs> that's great. I mean, right. That's, that's, that's so, it's perfect. It's all in right? your head. It's yes. all in your head. And, you know, the more we can sort of stop struggling against these thoughts and voices and realize that like humor and a little lightness and a little self-deprecation you know i i don't know about you but most nights i wake up at about you know 301 and and you know my voice is like <laughs> let's go let's go let's review your high school years right let's worry about uh, everything let's yeah. let's review the acne you had let's review the thing you said to your boss that everyone went oh that was dumb I mean, the great thing is, yeah, you laugh at your anxiety. I mean, look, I make jokes about my anxiety all the time. And, you know, I'm a New York Jew, so I'm, um, you know, I was almost born to be anxious. Um, <laughs> but it's almost like a badge of honor for me, too, you know. Um, yeah. But at the same time, at a certain point, I realized it wasn't always helping me. You know, it's like sort of when I finally went into therapy, I was like, oh, I'm actually. But I think if you can laugh at it, I mean, to be aware of it and to laugh at yeah. it is so freeing because it also can take you take you prisoner you know you can be so well yeah and and you know it, i think it can take you prisoner and i think i i think new york jews and boston catholics um, <laughs> probably share know, a lot they share a lot and i think too much of that self-deprecation that sort of self-loathing it builds these deep grooves and you know, the really smart people, the sort of the Pema Chodrons of the world, the big thinkers are like, hey, that might not be so helpful. It might be okay to like yourself. It might be okay to, to push yourself to be the best person you can be. But, but the lightness of humor, of self-deprecation, that might be a better place than the voice that kicks the heck out of you. Right. It's just hard to learn or rather unlearn. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Now, it's uh, interesting you mentioned Pema Chodron because she's somebody that was brought to my attention actually by a therapist. And I've listened to her her tape sometimes in my car and I'm, when I'm taking walks and stuff. 
are you a, a, a meditator? Is that something that you do to kind of ease your anxiety or do you do mindfulness? I, I would love to say that I am. I'm, <laughs> I'm not. I've tried, but I get, as Pema Chodron would say, I get hooked. I get yeah. hooked. I, I think the Tibetan word is Shenpa. It's getting hooked on a big, as she would say, a big, juicy thought that takes you down the road and 10 minutes have passed and you're like, wait, where am I? <laughs> you know, a conversation that never took place that, that you've written for you and three other people uh, whom you're now mad at because you had this conversation that never took place. I have tried meditation. I'll tell you, we left New York about two months ago and we came up to Cape Cod. And what I do instead of meditation is I walk. Um, and that, especially around here in the woods or by the beach, mm -hmm. and that for me is... Um, that's the closest thing to right. Just and you do it without right. without your earbuds, or or you just, or just no to no think. no no earbuds. Just I mean, thinking. because the the birds are going crazy and the wind through the trees, and it, uh, it you know it's it's funny. Mary Mary Oliver lived for many many years in Provincetown, um, a stone's throw from where I am, and she did not write at a computer or a typewriter. She wrote walking with a notebook and a pencil and. Uh, she said, "That's that's just the only way I can do it. I, that's when my 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 brain works when when my senses are alive to to the sounds of of wind through pine trees to the to the pond to the ocean to the and and I I I get that. Yeah, is that where you also come up with ideas? I've I've heard a lot of, I mean, everybody from like Bill Gates to I don't know, you know, great writers say some of their best ideas come up when they're walking." Um, not staring at your computer going, ah, oh, I've got to get this done. It's more like, yeah, I mean, there's nothing more terrifying than that sort of, you know, blank page, yeah. but, but yeah, I mean, I, I do tend to think a little better if I'm, uh, I'm moving. Uh, it's like that great scene in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance kid where they're trying to get hired to be bank guards mm -hmm. and Sundance kids, a great shot. And the guy's like, shoot that can. And he starts to sort of, you know, do his moves and stuff. And the guy's like, no, 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 hold the gun and shoot the can. And he misses. Right. And the guy starts to walk away. And the Sundance kid says, can I move? And the guy's like, what? And he sort of does this thing and moves and shoots the can like four times in a row. He goes, I'm better when I move. Right. It's If I can get the idea while walking and then sit down and then hone it so that I have something to work from, that tends to work a little better. Yeah, that's great. All right. You have the book in front of you. I, I actually found one, well, there's probably more than one in there that seems very apropos for what we're going through now. And I, there's one where there's somebody shaking a hand, which is so now, you know, it's all about like, how did you wash your hand? Do you know that? Oh, one? yeah. Um, that one is totally, I think it's called like, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. You're absolutely yeah, right. I was right. Do you mind uh, doing nice to meet you? What if I do? <laughs> Um, I would be happy to because uh, this is this is this is the poem for our times. This could it really is. You know, this was, is the one that should be published. You know, on every CDC. It's true. <laughs> website, listen. right? Nice to meet you. Now, what do I do with my hand? I mean, the one you just shook with your germ-infested one. Are you a clean man? You don't look it to me. Sure, you are a senior client in charge of marketing, but where has that senior client hand been? Not under scalding water like my hand. And now you have ruined that. You have been talking since we shook hands, though I do not know for sure what you have been saying, as I have been thinking about my dirty hand. I was just going to grab a sandwich, but I can't now. I have to go back to the bathroom. When I said nice to meet you earlier, I was lying. It, first of all, it, are you a germ phobe or was that based on kind of a reality where, you know, you're just like, oh, God. Uh, you know, I, I don't like touching other humans. <laughs> okay. Good. I mean, I guess, yeah, I guess that's the definition, right? Yeah, yeah. And that was, that was, listen, that's pre-pandemic that you wrote that. And now it's, it's even more, now, now everybody feels that way. Although if you're shaking people's hands now, I don't know what, what's the matter with you. I mean, shaking people's hands, kissing them near yeah. their mouth, oh, hugging God. their bodies. That's, that's 
that's gone the way of the dodo, Jonathan. <laughs> that is, I wonder if we will ever shake hands again. I really don't know if that'll ever happen. I don't, I, I'm, and by the way, I'm fine with not shaking hands. I lived in Japan for a year. I think it's very nice to not have to do that. They were so well, weirded bowing, out when you were, yeah, bowing, bowing is perfect. Is lovely. It's a lovely, you know, they, that was probably invented as a result of Disease. pandemics in the past and disease in the yeah. past. I know. Yeah. Or we could just sort of make a little, like a, Hey, like there, there's so many new things we could do. It, that, that shaking hands in, in a grosser way reminds me of a, something that happened to me. Not that recently. Thank God. Cause I would have completely freaked out where somebody was talking to me and, and a little projectile of food flew, <laughs> flew onto my, you know, onto my face. Like I could feel it on the side of my che cheek. And it's like that feeling of like, do you wipe it away? Like I'm so I'm so nice that I I didn't want to make the person feel bad by wiping away the little particle of food that was now on my face that they had kind of. But I'm the whole time I'm just thinking there's a little particle of food on the side, and as soon as you finish this conversation, you're going to scrub it, <laughs> scrub it. Yeah, yeah, it's horrible. <laughs> I mean the 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 grossest thing that ever happened to me in New York. I was on the subway. And I always sit, as a lot of New Yorkers do, when I sit, right. which is, I, I prefer to stand, but it was not rush hour. So I'm, you know, at the seat near the pole near the door. Right. And there's a guy who stands up and, he, you know, as New Yorkers do, you know, you can't, you know, you can't wait till the subway gets to the station. You got to, you got to get ready to move. Right. And uh, so he's standing there and I happen to look up as he's yawning. Uh, and you know that thing under your tongue that shoots saliva? Yes. It just, he yawns and he, it's just like this turbocharged saliva, oh. like several drops. I'm looking up and they come and they land on my face. <laughs> and he sees it all. It's like slow motion. And he has such a perfect New Yorker reaction. He starts laughing. Oh, God. But like, and, and sort of going like, oh, sorry. Oh, God. And then gets off. And <laughs> I'm covered with his. Spittle. His fluid. <laughs> oh, God. His, his. Flu I'm like, ha. Ah, what do you ah. do? Help. <laughs> right. And so that's cool. Yeah. Then, so, yeah. Then you're stuck for the rest of the day. I think I may have given you your next poem. Just that story. And then we, you know, he and I, he and I had dinner, but you know, nothing ever came of it. <laughs> nothing ever came. Well, John, this has been a pleasure, as I hope you oh, would think gosh. so too. I hope you won't go back and think that. I really, that John I really Small. enjoyed it. Me too. I really enjoyed it, and and thank you so much, so much for having me on. I, I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for writing such funny stuff and and keeping us laughing during not so such funny times all the time. So it's it's nice to have that release. <laughs> Have a nice day. At school drop-off, one of the moms said casually, Have a nice day. And I thought, what the hell does she mean by that? Does she think I don't have nice days? Was she being sarcastic? Does she not think I'm nice? She kind of hit the word day, as if to say, Have a nice day, you freak. Did I say something wrong? Why did she use the word nice? Does she think my days aren't normally nice? Maybe it was the have, have a nice day. What does that even mean? Like I don't have any purpose to my days? I'll tell you what I have now. I have a headache and a pit in my stomach, thanks to that bomb you just dropped on me. So thanks for that. You have a nice day too. That's what I should have said.